for 60 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I very much appreciate the privilege to address you this evening on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And I, I also appreciate the dialogue that takes place here on the, on the floor. Uh, this is uh, the most deliberative body anywhere in the world, and we have a privilege to be part of it. Uh, and as we engage in this debate, um, it's a circumstance that across this country, Madam Speaker, people listen in. And uh, they're reading the newspapers and following the blogs and uh, watching their cable news networks and some also some regular TV. And uh, as this conversation goes on here, Madam Speaker, it echoes out across the entire land. And uh, as this conversation echoes across the entire land, it also becomes part of the national dialogue. This national dialogue that takes place uh, in our schools, in our churches, at the workplace, in the coffee shop, in the break room, across the backyard fence, uh, on the snowmobile, outside doing chores. Over and over again, Americans interact with each other. And uh, while that's going on, they talk about a lot of things that matter to them. Um, the aftermath of the Super Bowl, uh, but also current events. And America is at this point transfixed on the current event of the I think not aptly named stimulus plan that's being debated over in the, the rotunda in the United States Senate, Madam Speaker. And so as this American conversation takes place, they are moving towards a consensus. And sometimes we don't achieve that consensus, uh, Madam Speaker. But the more dialogue we have, the more facts that are brought to play. And in fact, uh, many members in this body know that if they can bring the emotional anecdote to play, it also moves people's opinions. The things that move people's opinions bring us towards a consensus. When we arrive at a consensus, that consensus, if America's consensus doesn't match up with the congressional consensus, you will see many members, Madam Speaker, in this chamber will shift their position to realign themselves with their constituents. Now, there are two ways to do this job. One way is to stand up and and uh, lay out the framework of the principles that we believe in as individual members and then hang on to that framework attached to it the components of public policy that are compatible with the fundamental belief framework that's what i believe i've done and i uh, very much like the input that i receive from my constituents the people from my state and across the country that adds to my knowledge base so that i can make a reasoned informed decision that's the approach I think the founders uh, had in mind when they wrote this Constitution and established this Constitutional Republic, was that there would be representatives in this Constitutional Republic that would come here. We owe our constituents, all of them, our best effort, and more importantly, Madam Speaker, we owe them our best judgment. That's one way of doing this job here in the United States Congress. The other is, uh, Madam Speaker, to take a position that you're going to get in front of your constituents, see where they are going, check the wind, uh, the wind speed, the barometer, so to speak, um, and then put up a vote and take a position that reflects the position of your constituents. That goes on in this Congress and, uh, too often, uh, Madam Speaker, and it troubles me. It troubles me because we are elected for our effort and our judgment, and we owe our constituents our best judgment. But if our judgment is just simply to check the wind, um, put our finger in the air, then we're not offering to the, to the system we have here the things that we should have to contribute. And I would bring a little um, anecdote of Robespierre to mind. Um, he was um, pretty well established within the French Revolution. He was an advocate for the effective and ruthless utilization of the guillotine to get rid of his political enemies and get rid of the aristocracy that he believed had drugged the, the French down and brought about this revolution. But as the people marched in the streets, Robespierre went to the window and looked out and saw the mobs marching through the streets in France. This would be about 1789. And he said, I'd better get in front of them and see where they are going, for I am their leader. Now, that's no kind of leader that just simply tries to lead the mob wherever it is that they happen to be going. And some months later, Robespierre was uh, one of about 16,000 Frenchmen and women that found themselves a head shorter. Um, but that kind of leadership didn't work very well for Robespierre, and it doesn't work very well for the United States of America. It's our task to have a vision for the future. We need to articulate that vision. We need to articulate the principles that we believe in. 
and build policies around those tried and true principles that have created this great American nation. It isn't going to be a giant mosaic of uh, 435 members that stick their finger in the wind and decide what position they're going to take that will extend their, their tenure here in the United States Congress, Madam Speaker. It's going to be the people who look into the future with a vision that they can sell to the American people and say, maybe you're not here yet. Maybe you're not ready to move where we need to go. But this nation is too important for, to be a reactionary member of Congress. We've got to be a leadership members of Congress. We're each elected for our leadership as well. So let me submit, Madam Speaker, that I look back on last year's vote, that vote before the election, that was a $700 billion bailout. Without a prediction on the prospects of its success, it simply was an emphatic request from then Secretary of the Treasury Paulson that he needed to have a checking account with $700 billion in it, all borrowed money, I might add, so that he could spend it at his discretion to pick up the toxic debt as he described. And that's how we ended up with the TARP fund. And so we let the first half of that out, the $350 billion, and the second half was contingent upon the uh, successful deployment of the first half. And uh, I see not the signs of success of that first half. In fact, our stock market has continued to tank. Our economic indicators are going in the wrong direction. This $350 billion that went into his hand that much of it did get uh, expended um, with the other $350 billion that now this Congress has approved that it go there. It only took the approval of one body to do that, and the Senate did that. Um, that's a start on this economic stimulus component. But I did not hear a clearly articulated argument back then, back that started here on September 19th when Secretary Paulson came to this Congress and culminated in a vote that was in early October. I didn't hear clearly articulated the principles that they would adhere to on how America was going to get back on track. And so, I look on this continuum of mistakes that have been made, and I take us back to a year, and, I'm, and it's my recollection, it's not a confirmed date, but about 1978 when the Community Reinvestment Act was passed and became law. That's a component of the flaws that we have. There was legislation that I think was inspired for the right reasons. I think it was well-intentioned, but it turned out to be a large mistake. And it was because there were lenders that would redline certain inner city neighborhoods that they decided that the value of the real estate wasn't going to be sustained in those neighborhoods. And sometimes the residents uh, didn't have a very good credit rating. So but combination of those two things, they just said, these whole neighborhoods we're not going to loan money in. People there couldn't buy a house. They can't buy a house that sent the, the real estate value spiraling downward. And uh, a blanket decision like that by drawing a red line around a map was the wrong thing to do, Madam Speaker. Um, but the roots of a problem were created out of the good intentions of trying to provide for loans uh, for residences within those neighborhoods that had been redlined. And the Community Reinvestment Act was born. And it was refreshed again in the early 90s. I believe it was 1993, brought up to a little more modern language. But in it all, it held lenders accountable if they wanted to expand their lending operations, set up a branch operation uh, somewhere. They had to meet the scrutiny of the regulators who would look at the Community Reinvestment Act and say, what are you doing to expand your loans into these neighborhoods? And if the answer was nothing, they were denied an opportunity to expand their, their operations, set up a branch or, or consolidate. They were essentially stuck in place unless they could comply with this regulation of really making bad loans in neighborhoods that the real estate value couldn't be sustained. Once you lay down a foundation and a parameter like that, then you encourage the lenders to give bad loans. And when the lenders were giving bad loans in order to be positioned so that their portfolios were a, a certain percentage of those bad loans, um, doing so so they had the, the ability to expand and we had an economy that was expanding, although going to the 80s it was not. We had, our, we had our farm crisis, our real estate crisis, and our energy crisis all together in the 80s. And we lost 3,000 banks in the United States. And uh, I remember clearly the, the load and the difficulties that we had. Um, my neighbors and myself included aged um, you know, very quickly during those years of the 80s. 
So the Community Reinvestment Act from 1978 didn't turn out to manifest itself in its negative composition uh, because we had an economic crisis in the 80s that was taking banks down and requiring the FDIC to come in and take over the banks and, and make some moves to prop back up our financial world. And they did some moves then in the 80s that we haven't done here in this particular era. But in any case, by the time we got into the early 90s, the Community Reinvestment Act was, was re-established and refreshed. And at that point, things started to move. And when we got into the, the late 1990s and the early 2000s, then we saw natural interest rates. We saw the money supply such that the interest rate was driven down. Uh, part of the reason for that was to create an economy that would create a, a housing boom. So if you have a housing boom that's driven by low interest rates, people would look at that and conclude that they could build a new home or they could buy a high quality used home that allowed someone in that used home to build a new home. And, uh, and the housing boom began. And it, and, the, and it set up a market that exceeded the demand. Um, and we reached the point where we had the highest home ownership of any, of any time in our nation's history. I remember President Bush announcing that we'd reached 68% uh, of the people in America lived in their own homes. And I think that number got marginally higher after he had made that statement. But in any case, as this came together, we had a lot of those were bad loans. We had, we had bad loans that were made into these neighborhoods under the incentive of the Community Reinvestment Act and facilitated in a very large way by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who uh, had been, who had been uh, set up as a, um, a quasi-government entities, later privatized, and then moved towards the quasi-government agencies again, and here on the floor of this Congress, when the problems began to arise and we saw that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac weren't capitalized, consistent with the other lending institution, their competitors, and they weren't regulated in the same fashion as uh, the, their competitor lending institutions that gave an unfair advantage to the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac institutions. They were the secondary loan market, and they nearly cornered the secondary loan market of the mortgage market in the United States. And we came to the floor in this Congress once in, in 2001, give me plus or minus a year on that one if you might, Madam Speaker, but again, and made the debate that we should regulate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac more like other lending institutions because it was too high a risk for the taxpayers to take. Well, that amendment and that effort failed in those earlier years in this millennium, Madam Speaker. And then, I remember the date, it was here on this floor and it took place from that microphone there and that microphone over there. It was an amendment that was brought to the floor October 26, 2005 by Congressman Jim Leach of Iowa, who was um, and remains a very well respected among the banking community and the lending institutions. He brought an amendment that would have brought Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into the similar capital requirements of the banks and the similar regulatory requirements of the banks. I think he stopped one step short with that amendment. I think he should have moved him towards uh, the, um, the, the, the clear free market side of this. But in any case, as that amendment was debated twice in this millennia, twice in this last decade at least, we've had an opportunity to get Fannie Mae and Freddie, Freddie Mac right. They were, again, Madam Speaker, playing off of and capitalizing on the language in the Community Reinvestment Act that said make bad loans in these neighborhoods that uh, don't have a very good value of their real estate. But twice we turned away from shoring up Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, tightening them up, putting them back into the competitive marketplace. And so we found ourselves in a situation where when AIG was ready to go under and the $85 billion got poured in there about in that era, I saw a little bit before that, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac became very unstable and we had to step in as the federal government and nationalize the balance of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now the taxpayers own Fannie and Freddie. And now Fannie and Freddie don't have any new regulation that requires them to meet those capital and regulatory requirements, but we missed an opportunity to privatize them and regulate them according to the other lending institutions. The compound effect of Community Reinvestment Act, mark-to-market accounting, the, um, 
the uh, credit default swaps that were taking place, the, regu the lack of regulation on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the defense that came from the now chairman of the uh, Financial Services Committee from Massachusetts, who stood at that microphone and debated Mr. Leach, who was at this microphone, and at a certain point, the political center of gravity on that debate went towards the gentleman from Massachusetts, and I think the lobbying effect had a had a had an effect on the result as well, Mr. Speaker. But in any case, the Leach Amendment went down. That was our last opportunity that I know on this floor to get Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac right. So we had large financial indicators that were going in the wrong direction. And as this started to tumble, it started to snowball downhill. It took us to this point on September 19th when Secretary Paulson came to the Capitol uh, and insisted that he have the $700 billion checking account to spend as he saw fit. And within those narrow parameters, well, not so very narrow parameters, and within a broad definition, a huge um, authorization slash appropriation, and uh, maybe the largest that had ever passed out of this Congress, and I, I'm not certain about that, but it was huge. So it brought us to this point where there was a $700 billion bill on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And that bill passed off the floor with, I think, too many Republican votes, um, and had been pleased if it had none, but an awful lot of Democratic votes as well, Madam Speaker. That was the time that this Congress crossed the Rubicon. It was the time we had a chance to draw back. I believe that if cooler heads would have prevailed, if we would go back and, and actually got... Uh, and got a do-over on that, I do not believe the $700 billion bailout bill would pass because the American people have now seen what's unfolded and that they expected to see the markets increase and stability come into our marketplace and, and the capital that had been chased to the sidelines come back into the marketplace again. It hasn't done that. In fact, it looks like more capital has gone to the sidelines because, um, you know, money is, money is smart. And... Uh, smart money uh, finds its way into the best investment at the time, and right now that money has been scared out of the marketplace. But that's $700 billion. And when I listen to the gentleman from Minnesota who um, left the floor a moment ago, Madam Speaker, and he talked about the surplus that we had in the year 2000. Well, that happens to be the last year of the Clinton administration, and it is true that we had a surplus during several of those years. But the, the gentleman from Minnesota started to address this, and I will say was on the, he recognized that he was in the process of misspeaking and backed up uh, to say that um, the budget surplus was an accomplishment of the administration at the time. At least was the implication of his words, and it's not a quote, and I don't want it to be characterized as that, uh, Madam Speaker. Then to go on and argue that this deficit is a deficit that's comes out of the Bush administration. And so uh, here we are, we have, a, we have a member of Congress here that will argue and has argued that the, the Clinton administration deserves the credit for the surplus that was in our budget in the year 2000, and the Bush administration deserves the blame for the deficit that we have today. Well, all right, on surface, maybe you can make that connection. Uh, the first point I'd like to make, and, and be happy to have this dialogue with the gentleman from Minnesota, should he arrive on this floor, I would be happy to yield and have that dialogue. First point I'd make is, all of this spending starts here in the House of Representatives. There is no president that can initiate spending. There's no senator that can initiate spending. All appropriations bills, according to the Constitution, start here in the House of Representatives. If we start them here, and they can't be authorized, they can't be spent until the majority of the House of Representatives approves it. And sure, we start them here, we send them to the Senate, the Senate passes them, it comes back to a conference, we conference, both vote and pass it, if it passes, and then it goes to the President for a signature. But the House, if determined and organized and unwilling to uh, cave in to the Senate or the White House, controls every penny of spending that comes through this United States government. Uh, every, 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 every penny of appropriations. We do it here. It's ordered by the Constitution. So, 
it doesn't do for any member of Congress to say, uh, Madam Speaker, or to the, uh, to the rest of the world, that the responsibility was in the hands of a president, although that we recognize that the presidents do exert significant influence on the judgment of members of Congress, and they do present a budget to this floor, and they do negotiate those budgets because they sit back with the veto power that gives, um, that gives an appropriate tension that helps bring out a negotiated solution most of the time. But, Madam Speaker, Congress has the responsibility, and a president can't initiate spending. And so I'll submit this, that um, this $700 billion bailout plan that passed last year was on our watch. It was on my watch, and it was on the watch of the gentleman from Minnesota. I voted no. He can speak to how he voted. I believe I recall that was a yes. And uh, the $700 billion, as big a mistake as I believe it was, was also a mistake that was made, not just by the gentleman from Minnesota, but by the current president of the United States, who voted for the $700 billion plan as a senator of the United States, and that's attached to him as his responsibility. He needs to answer for the $700 billion bailout plan that gets attached to this, um, this huge stimulus package that he is the, partly the author of and the advocate of. And, so even though the stimulus plan that passed out of the House uh, with a, not a single Republican vote, when it came time to vote for this um, stimulus plan, so to speak, the yes votes by Republicans were a big goose egg up on the scoreboard. Not one Republican thought it was a good idea to roll out this $819 billion in spending in the stimulus plan from the House, which was accompanied by $347 billion in interest liability that goes with it. You have to pay interest on your debt. We're probably going to end up borrowing money to pay the interest on the debt, and I can tell you that spirals downwards pretty fast. But the $819 billion, when added the roughly $100 billion in the Senate, that takes it up to, I just used the $900 billion, and the interest rate that's out of the House side, $347 billion, this is the low number, uh, the lowest estimated number I can come up with, with interest and the Senate dollars in there, one and a quarter trillion dollars in stimulus money. That number is $1.247 trillion. That gets coupled to the $700 billion, and that was the bailout plan from last year. The $700 billion that President Obama and the gentleman from Minnesota voted for, and now the one and a quarter trillion dollars is being debated in the United States Senate, all his. The president owns that. And when you add that together, it rounds pretty handily to two trillion dollars. And now, Madam Speaker, a two trillion dollar bailout slash stimulus plan and a stock market that continues to tank, a financial world out there that lacks confidence that government is doing the right thing, uh, since the election, in fact, since before the election, we've watched our economy spiral downward. We've watched our market indicators spiral downward. We've watched, watched our interest rates, or excuse me, we've watched our unemployment rates go up. Those indicators do not indicate confidence in the leadership that we have in the financial world. And so the financial world, the investment world, the people that are putting capital in that are, that are, that's used to expand the productivity and the distribution and the market share of our companies, they're pulling their capital out. They're increasingly holding it. They're buying bonds. Maybe some of it, I'm sure some of it is sewed up in the mattress by now. Some is invested in gold. Some is invested in foreign currency as well, although I'm a bit surprised that our dollar has held up as strong as it has, and that's more an indicator of what the... Um, the weakness of foreign currency rather than reason to consider there to be strength in this U.S. dollar today. In any case, the supply U.S. dollars has gone up, and as it has, um, the instability goes with it. And so, a $2 trillion stimulus plan, 100% lock, stock, and barrel owned by President Obama, who said to us that it is one leg of a multi-legged stool that has to be built in order to get this economy back on track again. And now, let me submit that there are two ways to look at this economic situation. One of them is the Keynesian approach, which is that if government can pour enough money into the economy, get enough money in the hands of enough people 
who will take that money and spend enough of it that it stimulates the economy. So if more people go out and buy an extra loaf of bread or buy a car or maybe go to the theater or the ball game or maybe buy a ball glove themselves, uh, that increased spending will stimulate a demand that will cause more manufacturing and more goods to be brought into our economy. That's the Keynesian approach. Um, the problem with it is, is that looking back in history and the times that we've done such things, the actual economic numbers don't support the idea that pouring money willy-nilly into the economy in an indiscriminate fashion results in a stimulation of our economy. I won't argue, Madam Speaker, that there aren't some places where government can invest money that does stimulate the economy. Uh, one of those places would be <clears throat> if, um, if we invest in transportation links that open up development in new areas and help goods and services move back and forth in a more efficient fashion. That does create economic development. Transportation has been the number one uh, best tool to use to grow economic development throughout the history of all of humanity. So I don't take it all off the table, but there's much that is on the table that I would take off. Um, I wouldn't put a dollar into the National Endowment for the Arts in order to and call it economic development or stimulus. Um, here is another piece that I was just looking at. Um, that there's of the of the infrastructure funding within this stimulus package there's language in there that bans that money from going to facilities to from going into facilities that are, allow religious worship in them I, it, it looks to me like that is a first amendment violation that we would discriminate against facilities that allow people